So good afternoon, everyone, and I would like to thank the organizers for providing me with the possibility to report a part of my work and to introduce you further to uh, the mino and lamps stored here in the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, here we go. So I will not bother you uh, more about the Aegean Bronze Age context, so I will directly switch to the presentation. Just wanted to say that uh, within the growing tones of, especially during the second millennium BC in Crete, people had to find a, a new way to light themselves. And one of the ways they found was to use lamps. So I'm not saying, of course, that the uh, lamps date back to the Bronze Age period, where lamps are way older. I think the earliest examples date back to the Paleolithic period, around 20,000 BC. But I'm saying that during the second millennium BC, they became a lot more numerous, especially in Crete. So what is a lamp now? Of course, I was not allowed to light uh, an archaeological lamp, so I used an experimental one so as to explain you what it is exactly. A lamp is a vessel, either in clay or in stone, made, with a, made of a body like this, like this one, and it, has, it had some uh, inside a fuel, either, so this is the body, it had a fuel inside, either vegetable oils, animal wax, animal fat, sorry, or beeswax. And inside was also a wick made of uh, fiber plants on which was burning a uh, flame for a couple of hours. Of course, this is not what we find in excavations since, uh, as you are probably aware, uh, both the fuels and uh, the plants uh, disappear. They will not preserve for time. And so most of the time, if we are lucky, this is what we find. So this is a beautiful, complete example of lamp with a spot and a handle opposite to the spot. This is where the wick was, and this is where the fuel was. And, but of course, this is at best. And sometimes we also find these kind of things which do not have a, the shape of a lamp at all because there is no spot and no uh, handle, but there are soot deposits on the rim which indicates that a wick was uh, burning uh, there. So, this is why it is important to pay attention to these very uh, tiny traces, let's say. And when you are extremely lucky, you can find also this kind of beautiful lamp. So this is a Minoan lamp coming from Crete, which is stored here in the Royal Ontario Museum. It is made of stone and it is an extra, extra, extraordinary discovery because these uh, big, tall pedestal lamps were extremely rare uh, in Crete at that time. And of course, you would find them not in a simple houses, let's say, but most probably, or most of the time, in palaces or uh, villa, which are like something in between a palace and a big mansion. And obviously, this one was found in a villa, which is called Tilisos, in the vicinity of the Palace of Knossos that uh, we have been talking before. It is dated to the late minus 1b, late minus 3a period, that is to say, in terms of uh, absolute chronology, around 1,000, uh, like 15, uh, yeah, 1,500 and 1,380 BC. So the thing with uh, stone lamps, it's, it is difficult to date them because they have been in use for a long uh, period of time. And for this reason, this is why you have a, li a big lifespan, uh, yeah, lifespan, a uh, big period of time. We cannot really be more precise than this. This one is in serpentine. Serpentine was a hard rock uh, easily f that you can, one can still find easily in, uh, in Crete. There are many sources. It is gray, black, with uh, variegated, uh, yeah, variegated, with large pale brownish flecks. And so it is dark in terms of color. It has a polished surface. And I shall explain in a while why I'm, I am insisting on these uh, tiny details, because this is extremely important in terms of use. And as you can see, it is tall, it is big, with big dimensions. So obviously, it was used in a fixed manner in order to uh, probably to light uh, gathering in this villa of Tilisos. It is not the only example that was found in Crete, uh, especially Peter Warren especially conducted a comprehensive study in the 60s. He inventoried a certain number of minoan uh, stone vases, including lamps, and one of them is this one, which was found in Palais Castro, which we have been also talking about a lot today. Uh, it was published in the beginning of the, of the 20th century BC. It belongs to the same time than the, than the one from Tilisos. It is tall with a columnar, uh, base, it, this one has a decoration, so a raised band or molding around uh, the center. And uh, it, shows, it shows that uh, during the late Minoan I period, which, which is considered one of the most important, important periods in Crete, like um, let's say the golden age of Crete, 
uh, these kind of lamps had some parallels in Crete, but also on the Greek mainland and in the islands that were at that time under Minoan influence. So these lamps were not only utilitarian objects, but they were also markers of the Minoan influence all over the Aegean world. Now, in the collections of the Royal Ontario Museum, you would also find these kind of objects, which are uh, collar jars made of uh, marble, well known from the, the Aegean archaeologists. Uh, they are found in the Cyclades, they date back to the third millennium BC, and there are four of this type here in the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, you can see that two of them uh, are made of Parian marble, so pa Paros was one of the main sources of marble back to that time. They are quite big, they have these uh, perforated handles all over, indicating that they were intended to be suspended, right? There is absolutely no evidence for they were used as lamps, however, they are very often published as such, and I shall now explain why. In fact, there is a, a strange resemblance, let's say, with these objects, which are still found in Orthodox uh, churches in Greece, right? Uh, they are named Candelia in modern Greek. This is why the, the archaeological vases are named uh, Candiles, in plural. And they also have this, uh, these handles intended to be suspended. You can see that some of them carried uh, or still carry candles, sometimes with the help of Candilithres, which are uh, floaters, right, for the week. Sometimes also, nowadays, you would find them with electric uh, devices. And uh, honestly, apart from this resemblance in shape, there is no evidence for our uh, cycladic candiles were used as lamp, but still, let's consider that this is a nice name to, uh, for them. <laughs> um, so, let us focus on the Let's, let's say most uh, securely identified lamp, which is the one from Tilisos. And I shall now try to give an insight into the way this material, these objects were used uh, based on the results of my PhD thesis, which I, which I defended in 2020 in Paris. In the frame of this work, I analyzed the lamps from four different settlements, Malia, Palé Castro, Rousseau-Lacos, uh, Comos, and Hania, Aya, Ekaterini Square. And the goal there was to analyze the evolution of uh, lighting devices through time during the second millennium BC in different settlements, in palaces, households, uh, craft areas, and so on. The, this research aimed to uh, understand the function and functioning of minoan lamps, but also what kind of fuels and wicks were used when possible, because I said in the beginning that it's, it's hard to, uh, to find them, but yet we have some uh, methods, and I will explain why, in what sense the light they produced, and uh, the activities that they used to light. In order to do so, or what, to do so, let's say, I applied a multidisciplinary approach, starting from the study of shapes, known as typology, the forming techniques, known as technology, but also user, uh, user traces analysis, so I, I paid attention to these soot deposits obtained by the combustion, right? UV, ultraviolet, and organic residue analysis, because we know that lipids can sometimes preserve especially in ceramics, and uh, tell us more about the kind of uh, animal or, let's say, fats that were used, contained. I also applied experiments, 3D modeling, in order to, uh, to address the issue of the light they produce, and finally, contextual and spatial analysis, so as to uh, reconstruct the, act the lit activities. What I demonstrated in this work is that there is a wide variety of lamps in terms of shapes, uh, and this is very nice for archaeologists because it helps us uh, dating the, like in terms of chronology, uh, the settlements. So, for example, starting from the hand lamps, you can see already an important variety. These lamps are most of the time in clay, but some of them are also in stone. They are produced during the whole uh, second millennium. They have a spot for the week, a handle. Sometimes they do not have a spot at all, as I explained in the beginning of this presentation. Then the, the variety continues. They are, they are like small dimensions, so they were obviously intended to be transported. Right? And then you have these intermediary shapes, which uh, could have up to two spots, not necessarily, opposite to which were two legs for the transportation. They could have a low foot, a low base, uh, with a variety in, among them, because you also have clay examples, but also stone uh, lamps. And finally, you have these pedestal lamps, such as the one from Tilisos, which is stored here, uh, which could have up to four uh, spots or wick cuttings for the, the ones in, uh, in stone. And this, obviously, was 
something made in order to increase the light intensity because the more uh, like the more the more numerous the, the spots or the wick cutting, uh, the more numerous were the wicks, and so uh, there were more flames to light the spaces. Also, an important thing, as I said in the beginning, is that most of the time these examples, these lamps, were coated for those in clay or highly polished for those in stone. And the reason for that is that this was a way to increase uh, the to increase the light intensity because the light would reflect more on this kind of dark and polished surfaces than those simply smoothed. As for the fuels, as I said, there are some ways to identify the fuels used, but uh, there are still this uh, kind of approaches, so uh, organic residue analysis are still limited in Crete, uh, and at the moment they have identified, people like scholars have identified two fuels in a limited number of items, safflower oil in a lamp dated to the Mino Middle Minoan period in Psira, and uh, beeswax in lamps from Middle Minoan Festos and Late Minoan Mochlos and Psira. But this is all, and we are talking about like maybe five or six lamps, so it's very limited in comparison with the high number of lamps during this period. I also proposed a novel methodology in order to uh, identify the fuels used. I cannot, this methodology is based on the observation of uh, the organization of the soot deposits in the lamps, and it allows for the identification of vegetable oils, animal fats, and beeswax, but it cannot tell the species of uh, vegetable oils or animal fats. However, it can tell whether they were liquid or solid fuels, right? And this interesting thing in this graph is that you can see that in all the settlements under analysis, well, it was not only vegetable oils, as one could assume, since Crete is uh, boast lots of uh, oil plants, oil-based plants, right? But they were also uh, many uh, animal fats, and the reason for that is that obviously the Minoans would uh, use all the resources available in their surrounding, right? And also interestingly, starting from the Neopalatial period, you would find some beeswax in a certain number of lamps, and the reason could be that perhaps people were looking for the smell because they appreciated the odors. I don't know exactly, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning. Now, in terms of uh, functioning of lamps, this is the, the experiments I have applied. The experiments aim to uh, reconstruct and measure the light ambiences and the burning duration with different kinds of fuels and uh, wicks. I used for this 26 replicas of lamps in clay and in stone. The clay lamps were made with locally sourced clays with iron oxide content. This is what gives them, them this uh, reddish color. While the blue calcareous, the, the stones, the stone lamps were made in blue calcareous, either dark like this or a bit lighter like this one. I, oh, sorry. Moving on. Yeah. I also used a certain number of fuels, uh, of course, those that, have, that were identified for residue analysis, so safflower oil, beeswax, but also any kind of fuels that we, for which we know that they were, they could have been used since we found some archaeologists found some uh, carbonized seeds, for example, of these plants or uh, bones of the animals. So the idea was to compare the, these different fuels, but also different wicks made in flax, hemp, papyrus, or reed fibers, and also uh, with different techniques, so simple thread, bride, rope, or a piece of textile. To start with the burning duration, I measured the, bur the burning duration with different fuels, different wicks, different, different lamps, and one of the results I obtained was, is that the capacity of the lamp is one of the major factors playing on the burning duration, one of the major parameters. So for example, in those two, exa in those two tests, let's say, uh, I used olive oil and uh, the same wick uh, made with linen, but this lamp it has a capacity, a bigger capacity, it's like uh, 0.25 liters, while this one has a capacity of solely 0.03 liters, and you can see that in the first test, the burning duration could last, could reach up to almost 42 hours with no intervention, while in the second one, uh, the burning duration was of five hours and uh, 30 minutes. Another important parameter for the burning duration is the nature of the, of the fuel used. As you can see here, vegetable oils produce, like could last longer than uh, beeswax and animal fax. And the reason for that is the way the fuels are absorbed by the wick. For example, with vegetable oils, which are liquid, well, the absorption is very smooth, very easy going, 
So uh, the flame could stay at the, at the level of the rim, let's say, and burn for hours. Whereas it went, it was, it's, it is way more chaotic with uh, beeswax, for, for example, which, is, which solidifies around the wick. And for this reason, the, the flame has constantly to go uh, towards the fuel, let's say, in order to be fueled. So it becomes bigger, and therefore it absorbs quicker, most quickly, the, the fuel. And there is a kind of in-between with the animal uh, fats, which, are, which can be used in a, sol in a liquid quid state, but they also solidify uh, during the use, and for this reason, the burning duration is uh, shorter. Finally, the last important parameter for this is the surface treatment of the lamp. And this is why I've been insisting on the polishing, on, uh, the, on the stone, and so on, because while applying different methods in order to uh, measure the surface treatments, I could demonstrate, so these methods are topographical methods, I'm not gonna get into the details, but here this one is called needle free drop deposition technique for contact angle, never mind. <laughs> uh, the burning, I could estimate that the burning duration was 1.3 times big higher with burnished, coated, and, uh, and um, polished surfaces than with simply smooth surfaces. So now you understand why with the lamp of Tilisos people would be looking for something very high, highly polished because of course it would increase not only the burning duration but also, as I shall explain, the, uh, the light intensity. Just to end up with this, uh, with this part, uh, thanks to uh, uh, available like uh, tools available online, so I don't remember the name of this one, I think it's called Crea Patrimoine, never mind. Uh, it is possible to measure the capacity of archaeological lamps based on the drawing, the drawing of their profile when they are complete, right? And thanks to this tool, but also thanks to the study I carried out on the surface treatments, the analysis of uh, uh, fuels used, I could estimate three groups of burning duration, as you can see here, among the Minoan lamps. So in the first group, this first group is, comprises the lamps that have a capacity comprised between 0.05 to 1 liter, corresponding to a burning duration starting from, ranging from 3.2 hours to 20.8 hours, whether the surface was smoothed or burnished, right? Of course, these are estimations, but I think at the moment these are the most accurate estimation. The second group comprises lamps with a capacity ranging from 1.5 to 3.1 liters, starting from 31 hours to 66 hours, which is quite a lot already. And then the third group, the third group had has capacity uh, superior to 7.5 liters with a uh, burning duration comprised between 120 and 156 hours. So what about the lamp from Tilisos? Well, surprisingly, although I've not measured it, it seems quite, it's not so deep. Uh, yeah, the, the vessel is not so deep. And so for some reasons, uh, I would place it in the first group, which means that although it was beautiful, although it was prestigious, well, maybe it could simply light activities, gathering for, I don't know, an evening, a night, something like that, but not for uh, many days in a row. Finally, in terms of light ambiences, I have recorded the first the flames heat thanks to a thermographic camera, and uh, I could demonstrate, this. you see the same graph that I presented before, but with this, uh, these graphs as well, I could demonstrate that there is difference according to the fuel used, Obviously, it is linked to the way the fuels, these fuels are absorbed. And for example, beeswax would produce a temperature way higher because of the way, the, as I explained before, the flame is absorbed here. So who knows, maybe it was also used as a as an heating device. This is something that requires uh, further research. Interestingly also, I could, I could observe that vegetable oils produce uh, flames that are in terms of uh, illumination and flames color, let's say, that are hotter than uh, animal, wats and animal fats and beeswax, in the sense that they are more like in reddish tones uh, than the others that are more like in uh, whitish tones, as you can see quite clearly here. And as I said many times, uh, the polish, the surface treatments, also increases the light intensity, so it would place our lamp in the upper part of this graph. So it's interesting also to wonder why Minoans uh, would have different, would, would seek different uh, light ambiences in their uh, settlements. Was it a conscious choice, for example? Also, the use of this photo photometric data is interesting because it can, we can use them in uh, 3D modeling. 
And uh, this is what we have been attempting to do here with this extreme, extraordinarily uh, well-preserved example, the Cartier Muat Malia that Carl presented uh, before. We have worked on two different areas of this district, the urban district dated to the, uh, let's say, around 1750 BC, uh, the Potter's Workshop and the North Area, which yielded lots of, of, uh, of uh, evidence for uh, craft activities, right? but also a certain number of lamps. And these are some proposals for the reconstruction based on the photometric data that we uh, gathered, that we recorded. A sunny day of June, uh, 1750 BC, at 9 a.m., at 5 p.m., and uh, after the dawn. And the main result of this research is that we could suggest that the lamps found in this uh, room were not only the production of the potter, which they were for sure, which we can take for granted, but they were also used probably to light the potter uh, in its activity because they had they have these uh, burn marks I was mentioning before, which indicate that they were used. So this opens up new uh, avenues in terms of research on uh, craft activities. So to end up with this presentation, I wanted just to give you some insight into a fictive reconstruction of lighting through the pedestal lamp from Tilisos stored here. As I said, uh, stone lamps are mostly found in palaces or villas such as Tilisos or uh, otherwise in outdoor areas, areas uh, so as to light probably nighttime activities, perhaps civic activities. This one has a multiple wick cuttings, here two. It implies several wicks burning together simultaneously, which was intended to increase the light uh, intensities. And the same, uh, and this is true also for the polished surface, which, was, which acted as a ref reflector. But despite, despite its wide dimensions, the lamp seems to have a low capacity and therefore a load for a short burning duration, perhaps for uh, short uh, time activities. And thank you very much for your, your, for your attention and I will answer your questions.